Section 12, Article 3 speaks about Miranda Doctrine. Any person under investigation for the commission of an offense shall have the right to be informed of his right to remain silent and to have competent and independent counsel, preferably of his own choice. If the person cannot afford the services of counsel, he must be provided with one. These rights cannot be waived except in writing and in the presence of counsel. Number two, no torture, force, violence, threat, intimidation, or any other means which vitiates the free will shall be issued or used against him. Secret detention, places, solitary, incommunicado, or other similar forms of detention are prohibited. 3. Any confession or admission obtained in violation of this or Section 17 hereof shall be inadmissible in evidence against him. 4. The law shall provide for penal and civil sanctions for violations of this section, as well as compensation to and rehabilitation of victims of torture or similar practices and their families. Source, Miranda v. Arizona, 384 U.S. 436. Rights are available only during custodial investigation. This is in un, under RA 7438. The rights guaranteed in Section 12, Article 3, exist only an, in custodial investigation or in custody interrogation of accused persons. People versus Judge Ison 175 Scra, which has been defined as the questioning initiated by law enforcement officer after a person has been taken into custody or otherwise deprived of his freedom of action in any significant way. The rule begins to operate as soon as the investigation ceases to be a general inquiry to an unsolved crime and direction is then aimed upon a particular suspect who has been taken into custody and to whom the police would then directly in direct interrogatory questions, which tend to elicit incriminating statements. People versus La Cruz, GR 118866-68. In the La Torre versus Court of Appeals, GR 102786, it was reiterated that the Miranda rights apply only from the moment the investigating officer begins to ask questions for the purpose of eliciting admissions, confessions, or any information from the accused. Thus, in People v. Barloloy, GR 14740, it was held that this guarantee does not apply to spontaneous statement, not elicited through questioning by the authorities, but given in an ordinary manner, whereby the suspect orally admitted having committed the offense. Neither can it apply to admissions or confessions made by a suspect before he was placed under custodial investigation. In this case, the narration before the barangay captain prior to custodial investigation was admissible in evidence, but not the admissions made before Judge Deacon, inasmuch as questioning by the judge was done after the suspect had been arrested in such questioning already constituted custodial investigation. Under RA 7438, custodial investigation shall include the practice of issuing an invitation to a person who is investigated in connection with an offense he is suspected to have committed, without prejudice to the liability of the inviting officer for any violation of law. Thus, in People v. Del Rosario, GR 127 Five, five, it was held that from the time Del Rosario was invited for questioning at the house of the barangay captain, he was already under effective custodial investigation because he was not apprised nor made aware thereof by the investigating officers and because the prosecution failed to establish that Del Rosario had waived his right to remain silent, his verbal admissions were inadmissible against him. In People v. Ordonio, GR 132154, the Supreme Court held that custodial investigation began when the accused Ordonio in Medina voluntarily went to the Santo police station to confess, and the investigating officer started asking questions to elicit information from them. 
in People v. Lugod, 136253. It was held that the accused should have been entitled to the Miranda rights because even assuming that he was not yet under interrogation at the time he was brought to the police station, his confession was elicited by a police officer who promised to help him if he told the truth. Furthermore, when he allegedly pointed out the body of the victim, the atmosphere was highly intimidating and not conducive to a spontaneous response as the whole police force and nearly 100 townspeople escorted him there. Not having the benefit of counsel and not having been informed of his rights, the confession is inadmissible. In People v. Pesudat, GR 128822, when the accused was brought to the station and made to sign the confiscation of the marijuana report, he was already under custodial investigation. Police lineup. A police lineup is not considered a part of any custodial inquest because it is conducted before that stage of investigation is reached. People versus Bravo, 135562. People versus Amistuzo reiterates this rule because in a police lineup, the process has not yet shifted from the investigatory to the accusatory stage, and it is usually the witness or the complainant who is interrogated and who gives a statement in the course of the lineup. In People v. Piedad, GR 131923, it was held that the right to counsel accrues only after an investigation ceases to be a general inquiry into an unsolved crime and commences an interrogation aimed at a particular subject who has been taken into custody and to whom the police would now propound questions. Thus, in People v. Dagpin, where three eyewitnesses identify the accused at the police station as the person who shot the victim at the scene of the crime, the accused cannot claim that he was deprived of his constitutional rights, even if he was without counsel at the time, because he was not yet under custodial investigation. However, in People v. Escordial, where the accused having became the focus of attention by the police after he had been pointed to by a certain Rami as the possible perpetrator of the crime, it was held that when the out-of-court identification was conducted by the police, the accuser was, was already under custodial investigation. GR 138934-35 An out-of-court identification may be made in a show-up where the accused is brought face-to-face -face with a witness for identification, or in a police lineup where the suspect is identified by a witness from a group of persons gathered for that purpose. During custodial investigation, these types of identification have been recognized as critical confrontations of the accused by the prosecution, necessitating the presence of counsel for the accused. This is because the result of these pretrial proceedings might well settle the fate of the accused and reduce the trial to a merely or a mere formality. Thus, any identification of an un counsel accused made in a police lineup or in a show-up after the start of custodial investigation is inadmissible in evidence against him. People versus Escordial. Investigations not considered custodial interrogation. A person under normal audit investigation is not under custodial investigation because an audit examiner can hardly be deemed to be the law enforcement officer contemplated in the rule. Navallo versus Sandy Gambayan. Because the court administrator is not a law enforcement officer, an investigation conducted by him does not constitute custodial investigation within the contemplation of the constitutional guarantee. Office of the Court Administrator versus Sumila. An investigation conducted by the Civil Service Commission involving fake eligibility is not custodial investigation. Remolana versus Civil Service Commission, GR 137. 473. In Carlos Tenenge v. Peepaw, GR 179.458, an administrative inquiry conducted by the employer in connection with an 
irregularity or anomaly allegedly committed by an employee is not custodial investigation. Thus, a written statement given by the employee during such inquiry is admissible in evidence. In People v. Salonga, GR 131131, where after an audit, the accused was summoned to appear before the assistant accountant of Metro Bank, and in the course of the interview, accused admitted having issued the subject cashier's checks without any legitimate transaction. The written confession was held admissible in evidence inasmuch as the interview did not constitute custodial investigation. In Ladiana versus People, it was held that the counter affidavits submitted by the respondent during preliminary investigation is admissible in evidence because preliminary preliminary investigation is not part of custodial investigation. The interrogation by the police, if any, would already have been ended at the time of the filing of the criminal case in court or in the public prosecutor's office. In People v. Manzano, it was held that when an arrested person signs a booking sheet in an arrest report at the police station, he does not admit the commission of an offense nor confess to any incriminating circumstance. The booking sheet is no more than a record of arrest and a statement of now how the arrest was made. It is simply a police report and it has no probative value as an extrajudicial statement of the person being detained. The signing of the accused of the booking sheet in the arrest report is not a part of custodial investigation. In People v. Indino, the Supreme Court ruled that the admission of the videotaped confession is proper. The interview was recorded on video and it showed accused unburdening his guilt willingly, openly and publicly in the presence of newsmen. Such confession does not form part of custodial investigation as it was not given to police officers but to media men in an attempt to solicit sympathy and forgiveness from the public. There was no showing that the interview was coerced or against his will. However, because the inherent danger in the use of televisions as a medium of, of admitting one's guilt, courts are reminded that extreme caution must be taken in further admitting similar confessions. Spontaneous statements or those not elicited through questioning by law enforcement officers, but given in an ordinary manner where the appellant verbally admits to having committed the offense, are admissible. People v. Guillermo, reiterated in Benjamin Gisalva v. People, GR 187725. The rights guaranteed by this provision refer to testimonial compulsion only. People v. Pinor. What rights are available? The rights under the Miranda Doctrine, which a person under custodial investigation is entitled to or to remain silent. If the suspect refuses to give a statement, no adverse inferences shall be made from his refusal to answer questions. To competent and independent counsel, preferably of his own choice, at all stages of the investigation, People v. Hassan and People v. Layuso, 175 Squa. If he cannot afford the services of counsel, he must be provided by the government with one. The right to counsel is intended to preclude the slightest coercion as would lead the accused to admit something false. In Gamboa v. Cruz, Supreme Court held that the right to counsel touches upon the start of the investigation, that is, where the investigating officer starts to ask questions to elicit information and or confes confessions or admissions from the respondent. At that point, the person being interrogated must be assisted by counsel to avoid the pernicious practice of extorting false or coerced admissions from the lips of the person undergoing investigation. The lawyer, however, should never pre prevent an accused from freely and voluntarily telling the truth. People versus Inanoria. People versus Continente. GR 10801. Indeed, as an officer of the court, it is an attorney's duty, first and foremost, to seek the truth. However, counsel should be able, throughout the investigation, to explain the nature of the questions by conferring with his client and halting the investigation should the need arise. The duty of the lawyer includes ensuring that the suspect under custodial investigation is aware that the right of an accused to remain silent may be invoked at any time.
people versus Sayabo. Thus, where the lawyer merely affixes his signature to the confession as saksi, or as witness, and he testified that he had not assisted the accused when the latter was investigated by the police, the extrajudicial confession is inadmissible in evidence. People versus Peralta. The accused is brought to the police station only to be identified by a witness. Technically, he is not yet under custodial investigation. People versus Hatuan. In People versus Buntan, inasmuch as all that the police investigator did was to show the suspect, the victim's sister, in the latter's sworn statement identifying him as one of the two suspects in the killing, and the police had not started questioning, interrogating, or exacting a confession from the suspect, the right to counsel may not be yet validly invoked. However, in People v. Bolon, Bolanos, were while being conducted to the police station on board, the police chief, the accused, made an extrajudicial confession that he had killed the victim. Inasmuch as the uncounseled confession was the sole basis of the judgment of conviction, it was held that the trial court committed a rever reversible error. While on board the police jeep, the accused was deemed to have been already under custodial investigation and should have been informed of his rights. The right to counsel is not required in a police lineup inasmuch as police lineup is not part of the custodial inquest. Neither may this right be invoked when the suspect is given a paraffin test as he is not yet under custodial investigation. People versus the Guzman and People versus Nam Singh. The suspect is likewise not entitled to the Miranda rights when he is merely photographed or paraffin tested. But in People v. Ordonio, it was held that custodial investigation commenced when the accused Ordonio and Medina voluntarily went to the Santo Police Station to confess and the investigating officer started asking to elicit information from them. At that point, the right of the accused to counsel automatically attached to them. When, because of the non-availability of practicing lawyers in that remote town, no counsel could be provided, the police should have already desisted from continuing with the interrogation, even if the accused gave consent to the investigation. The presence of the parish priest and the municipal mayor of St. Paul, as well as the relatives of the accused, did not cure in any way the absence of a lawyer during the investigation. In providing that during the taking of an extrajudicial confession, the accused parents, older brothers or sisters, his spouse, the mayor, municipal judge, district school supervisor, or priest or minister of the gospel, as chosen by the accused, may be present. RA 7438 does not propose that they appear in the alternative or as a substitute of counsel without any condition. It is explicitly provided that before the above-mentioned persons can appear, two conditions must be met, namely, a counsel of the accused is absent, and a valid waiver had been executed. In the absence of a valid waiver, none of the above-named persons can stand in lieu of counsel. The modifier competent and independent in the 1987 Constitution is not an empty rhetoric. It stresses the need to assure or assure the accused under the uniquely stressful conditions of custodial investigation, an informed judgment on the choices explained to him by a diligent and capable lawyer. The desired role of lawyer in the process of custodial investigation is rendered meaningless if the lawyer merely gives perfunctory advice as opposed to meaningful advocacy of the rights of the person undergoing questioning. If the advice given is so cursory as to be useless, voluntariness is impaired. People v. Suela, GR 133570. To be competent and independent, it is only required for the lawyer to be willing to safeguard the constitutional rights of the accused, as distinguished from one who would merely be giving a routine, preemptory, and meaningless recital of the individual's constitutional rights. People v. Bagnet, GR 133-685-86. Thus, in People v. Lucero, the court held that the petitioner was denied the right to counsel, where the lawyer not counseled the official of choice 
arrived at the CSI headquarters around 9 p.m. The second night of appellant's detention, talked to the appellant about his rights, left the appellant in the custody of CSI agents during the actual interrogation, and then came back the next day for examination and signature of the statement of the appellant. A similar conclusion was reached in People v. Murial, JR129295, where the lawyer left after about 30 minutes from the start of the investigation with instructions that before the accused signs any extrajudicial statement, it should be shown to him first. Indeed, as held in People v. Barmas, the mere pro forma appointment of a counsel, the official, who fails to genuinely protect the interests of the accused merits this approbation. Not independent counsel. In People v. Pendula, the Supreme Court stressed that the Constitution requires that the counsel be independent. Obviously, it cannot be a special counsel, public or private prosecutor, counsel of the police, or a municipal attorney, whose interest is admittedly adverse to the accused. As legal officer of the municipality, it is seriously doubted whether a municipal attorney can effectively undertake the defense of the accused without running into conflict of interest. In People v. Januario, it was held that there was a violation of this provision where the counsel who assisted the accused in the custodial investigation conducted by the NBI was an applicant for employment with the NBI, as he, in fact, joined the NBI a few months later. In People v. S. Panola, the Supreme Court declared that city legal officers was not an independent counsel within the purview of the constitutional provision. People v. Lubton. Neither can the mayor be considered an independent counsel because as mayor, his duties were inconsistent with his responsibilities to the suspect. People v. Velarde, 139933, and People v. Taliman. However, the mere fact that the lawyer was a retired member of the judge advocate's office does not cast any doubt on his impartiality in assisting the accused during custodial investigation. People v. Hernandez. The phrase preferably of his own choice does not convey the message that the choice of a lawyer by a person under investigation is exclusive as to preclude other equally competent and independent attorneys from handling the defense. Otherwise, the tempo of custodial investigation will be solely in the hands of the accused who can impede, nigh, obstruct the progress of the interrogation by simply selecting a lawyer who, for one reason or another, is not available to protect his interest. People v. Barasina. Thus, in People v. Espirito, it was held that the right to counsel does not mean that the accused must personally hire his own counsel. The constitutional requirement is satisfied when a counsel is engaged by anyone acting on behalf of the person under investigation or appointed by the court upon petition by said person or by someone on his behalf. While the choice of a lawyer in cases where the person under custodial interrogation cannot afford the services of counsel or where the preferred lawyer is not available, is naturally lodged in the police investigators. The suspect has the final choice as he may reject the counsel chosen for him and ask for another one. A lawyer provided by the investigators is deemed engaged by the accused when he does not raise any objection against the counsel's appointment during the course of the investigation and the accused thereafter subscribe to the veracity of the statement before the swearing officer. People versus duress. And in People versus Gallardo, People versus Continente. Thus, in People versus Alberto, GR 132374, where the accused was not asked whether he wishes or can afford or retain his own lawyer, but was merely told that attorney Sima Franca was a lawyer and asked if he needed his services, it was clear that he was not made aware that he could choose his own lawyer other than the one assigned by the police. Confession obtained after charges had already been filed. In People v. Espanola, GR 119-308, the policeman brought accused Pakiangan to the prosecutor's office as the accused manifested his desire to confess. But when the notes were transcribed, accused refused to sign, and only the lawyers who assisted him signed the confession. It appeared, however, that when the prosecutor took the confession, an information for rape with homicide had already been filed against Pakyangan.
and his co-accused. Although Pak Yangon was no longer under custodial investigation when he gave his confession because charges had already been filed against him, nonetheless, the Supreme Court said that the right to counsel still applies in certain pretrial proceedings that are considered critical stages in the criminal process. Custodial interrogation before or after charges have been filed and non-custodial interrogation after the accused has already formally charged are considered critical pre-trial stages in the criminal process. Next, to be informed of such rights. In People v. Nicandro, the Supreme Court said that this contemplates the transmission of meaningful information rather than just the ceremonial and perfunctory recitation of an abstract constitutional principle. In People v. Canela, the Supreme Court reiterating the foregoing said that making the accused read his constitutional right is simply not enough. The prosecution must show that the accused understood what he read and that he understood the consequences of his waiver. In People v. Agustin, it was held that the right to be informed carries with it the correlative obligation on the part of the investigator to explain and contemplates effective communication which result in the subject understanding what is conveyed. Since it is a comprehension sought to be attained, the degree of explanation required will necessarily vary and depend on the education, intelligence, and other relevant personal circumstances of the person under investigation. This is in People versus Manriquez, People versus Samol, Samolde, Chair 128551. In People versus Sayabok, the court said that the right to be informed should allow the suspect to consider the effects and consequences of any waiver he might make of his rights. More so when the suspect is like Sayabok, who has an educational attainment of grade 4, was a stranger in Nueva Vizcaya and had already been under the control of the police officer for two days previous to the investigation, albeit for another offense. Rights cannot be waived except in writing and signed by the person in the presence of his counsel. Section 2 RA 7438 provides that any extrajudicial confession made by a person arrested, detained, or under custodial investigation shall be in writing and signed by such person in the presence of his counsel or in the latter's absence upon a valid waiver and in the presence of any of the parents. Older brothers and sisters, his spouse, the municipal mayor, the municipal judge, district, school supervisor, or priest or minister of the gospel as chosen by him. Otherwise, such extrajudicial confession shall be inadmissible as evidence in any proceeding. No tor torture, force, etc., which vitiates the free will shall be used. Where the appellants did not present evidence of compulsion or duress or violence on their persons, where they failed to complain to the officers who administered the oaths, where they did not institute any criminal or administrative action against the alleged intimidators for maltreatment, where there appeared to be no marks of violence on their bodies and where they did not have themselves examined by a reputable physician to buttress their claim, all these should be considered factors indicating voluntariness of confession. People versus Magnate. Secret detention places are prohibited. Confessions, admissions obtained in violation of rights are inadmissible in evidence. There are two kinds of involuntary or coerced confessions treated in this section, namely coerced confessions, the product of third-degree methods such as torture, force, violence, threat, and intimidation, which are dealt with in paragraph 2, and B, and counseled statements given without the benefit of the Miranda warning, which are the subject of paragraph of paragraph 1, People versus Vallejo, GR 144656. Note that the alleged infringement of the constitutional rights of the accused during custodial investigation is relevant and material only where an extrajudicial confession or admission from the accused becomes the basis of conviction. National Year of Investigation versus Judge Ramon Reyes. In People versus Bolanos, while being conducted to the police station on board the police jeep, the accused made an extrajudicial confession that he had killed the victim. And as much as this uncounseled confession was the sole basis of the judgment of conviction, the lower court committed a reversible error. While on board the police jeep, 
The accused was already under custodial investigation and should have been informed of his rights. In People v. De La Cruz, where appellant, after having been apprehended but without the assistance of counsel, volunteered information that he had killed his wife and even led the authorities to the place where he allegedly buried the deceased, which yielded eight bones after the police had drug, had dug the site. It was held that the extrajudicial confession of the appellant is inadmissible for failure to comply with the constitutional requirements. In People v. Bonola, it was held that the 1973 Constitution did not distinguish between verbal and nonverbal confessions. As long as the confession is uncounseled, it is inadmissible in evidence. What is sought to be avoided by the rule is the evil of extorting from the very mouth of the person undergoing interrogation for the commission of an offense they were the very evidence with which to prosecute and thereafter convict him. In People v. Bernardino, it was held that the verbal admission made by the accused that he sold marijuana to Josan is inadmissible in evidence because the accused had not been properly informed of the Miranda rights. In People v. Morada, the Supreme Court held that the verbal confession of the accused to Barangay Captain Manimbao was made in the course of custodial investigation. Accordingly, the confession was inadmissible in evidence. In People v. Samolde, even as the extrajudicial confession was in writing and signed by the counsel because the accused was not given the Miranda warnings, that is, in form of his right to remain silent, that anything he says can and will be used against him, and that he is entitled to assistance of counsel, the confession was held inadmissible in evidence. But in People v. Andan, the Supreme Court held that the voluntary but uncounseled confession of the accused to the mayor, to the media, was admissible in evidence. In this case, it was noted that it was the accused who freely, spontaneously, and voluntarily sought the mayor for a private meeting, and the mayor did not know that the accused was going to confess his guilt. Accused talked with the mayor as a confidant, not as a law enforcement officer. The confession made by the accused to the news reporters was likewise free of undue influence from the police authorities. The news reporters acted as news reporters when they interviewed the accused. They were not acting under the direction and control of the police. Constitutional procedures on custodial investigation do not apply to the spontaneous statements not elicited through questioning by the authorities but given in an ordinary manner whereby the accused orally admitted having committed the crime. This is reiterated in People v. Domantai, where the Supreme Court said that the oral confessions made to newsmen are not covered by Section 12, Article 3. The Bill of Rights does not concern itself with the relationship between a private individual and another individual. Rather, it governs the relationship between the individual and the state. The prohibitions therein are addressed primarily to the state and its agents. As to the requirement that their extrajudicial confession must be corroborated by other evidence, the court said that there was the corpus delicti which corroborated the extrajudicial confession. As well, in People v. Ordonio, the tape interview taken by the DZNL radio announcer offered as part of the testimony of the said announcer where admissions were made by the accused who even expressed remorse for having committed the crime was admitted in evidence. On the strength of such testimony, the accused were convicted. In People v. Abulensha, GR138403, the confession made by the accused in a taped radio interview over Radio Bombo was held admissible in evidence as it was not shown that said reporter was acting for the police or that the interview was conducted under circumstances where it is apparent that the suspect confessed to the killing out of fear. Similarly, in People v. Maingan, GR170470, the court held that when the accused appellant was brought to the Barangay Hall in the morning of January 2, 2001, he was already a suspect in the fire that destroyed several houses and killed the whole family of Roberto Separa, Sr. And thus the confession of appellant given to the barangay chairman, as well as the lighter found by the latter in her bag, is inadmissible in evidence. But the testimony of 
Mercedita Mendoza, a neighbor of Roberto Separa Sr. on the same confession, is admissible in evidence and is not covered by the exclusionary rule. In Paper v. Suela, January 15, 2002, the letter containing incriminatory statements was written when the accused is no longer under custodial investigation and in open court. The accused admitted that he wrote it. The exclusionary rule will not apply to spontaneous statements not elicited through questions by the authorities. In Aquino v. Paiste, it was held that an amicable settlement does not partake of the nature of an extrajudicial confession or admission, but it, it is a contract between the parties within the parameters of their mutually recognized and admitted rights and obligations. Infractions of the Miranda rights render inadmissible only the extrajudicial confession or admission made during custodial investigation. Aquino cannot later claim that the amicable settlement is inadmissible in evidence for violating her Miranda rights. In People v. Judge Eisen, the court said, In fine, a person suspected of having committed a crime and subsequently charged with its commission has the following rights in the matter of his testifying or producing evidence. Letter A before the case is filed in court or with the public prosecutor for preliminary investigation, but after having been taken into custody or otherwise deprived of his liberty in some significant way, and on being interrogated by the police, the continuing right to remain silent and to counsel and to be informed thereof, not to be subjected to force, violence, threat, intimidation, or any other means which vitiates the free will, and to have evidence obtained in violation of these rights rejected in inadmissible. B. After the case is filed in court, to refuse to be a witness, not to have any prejudice whatsoever result to him by such refusal, to testify in his own behalf, subject to cross-examination, and while testifying, to refuse to answer a specific question which tends to incriminate him for some crime other than that for which he is being prosecuted. Applicability, the Miranda Doctrine, was first institutionalized in 1973 Constitution, which took effect on January 17, 1973. The rights guaranteed therein are to be given only prospective effect. Mogtoto versus Mangera. Waiver must be in writing and made in the presence of counsel. That is under Section 12, Article 3, it's number 1. But note the provision of RA 7438, no retroactive effect. The doctrine that an uncounseled waiver of the right to counsel and to remain silent is not to be given any legal effect was initially a judge made one and was first announced on April 26, 1983, in Morales v. Ponce and Rile, and reiterated in March 20, 1985, in People v. Galley. While this doctrine eventually became part of Section 12, Number 1 of Article 3, the requirements and restrictions therein have no retroactive effect and do not reach waivers made prior to April 26, 1983, the date of promulgation of Morales. Burden of proof? The burden of proving that there was valid waiver rests on the prosecution. The presumption that official duty has been regularly performed cannot prevail over the presumption of innocence. People versus Jara. People versus Taruk. Thus, in People versus Paole, where the police officer could not state positively whether the lawyer assisting the accused provided him with effective counsel during the crucial aspects of the investigation, because the police officer went out of the investigation room and heard only snatches of the conversation between the lawyer and the accused, and the lawyer was not presented as witness during the trial, the Supreme Court held that the confession given by the accused was not admissible in evidence. What may be waived? The right to remain silent and the right to counsel, but not the right to be informed of these rights. So what may be waived? The right to remain silent and the right to counsel, but not the right to be informed of these rights. Guidelines for Arresting and Investigating Officer in People v. Mahinay The Supreme Court laid down the guidelines and duties of arresting, detaining, inviting, or investigating officers of his companions as follows. Number one. A person arrested, detained, invited, or under custodial investigation must be informed in a language known to and understood by him of the reason for the arrest and he must be shown the warrant of arrest, if any. 
Every other warning, information, or communication must be in a language known to and understood by said person. Number two, he must be warned that he has the right to remain silent and that any statement he makes may be used as evidence against him. Number three, he must be informed that he has the right to be assisted at all times and have the presence of an independent and competent lawyer, preferably of his own choice. Number four, he must be informed that if he has no lawyer or cannot afford the services of a lawyer, one will be provided for him and that the lawyer may also be engaged in any by any person in his behalf or may be appointed by the court upon the petition of the person arrested or any act anyone acting in his behalf. Number five, that whether or not the person arrested as a lawyer, he must be informed that no custodial investigation in any form shall be conducted except in the presence of his counsel or after a valid waiver has been made. The person arrested must be informed that at any time he has the right to communicate or confirm confer by the most expedient means, that is, by telephone, radio, letter, or messenger with his lawyer, either retained or appointed. Any member of his immediate family or any medical doctor, priest, or minister chosen by him or by anyone, anyone of his immediate family or by his counsel or be visited by or confer with duly accredited national, international, and government organization. It shall be the responsibility of the officer to ensure that this is accomplished. He must be informed that he has the right to waive any of said rights provi provided it is made voluntarily, knowingly, and intelligently, and ensure that he understood the same. In addition, if the person arrested waives his right to a lawyer, he must be informed that th it must be done in writing and in the presence of counsel. Otherwise, he must be warned that the waiver is void even if he insists on his waiver and chooses to speak. The person arrested must be informed that he may indicate in any manner at any time or stage of the process that he has or he does not wish to be questioned with a warning that once he makes such indication, the police may not interrogate him if the same had not yet commenced, or the interrogation must cease if it has already begun. The person arrested must be informed that his initial waiver of his right to remain silent, to right to counsel, or any of his rights does not bar him from invoking it at any time during the process, regardless of whether he may have answered some questions or volunteered some statement. He must also be informed that any statement or evidence, as the case may be obtained in violation of any of the foregoing, whether inculpatory or exculpatory, in whole or in part, shall be inadmissible in evidence. Exclusionary rule. Confession or admission obtained in violation of Section 12, Section 17, Article 3 shall be inadmissible in evidence. A confession is a declaration made voluntarily and without compulsion or inducement by a person acknowledging that he has committed or participated in the commission of a crime. But before it can be admitted in evidence, the Constitution demands strict compliance with the requirements of Sections 12 and 17 of Article 3 because a confession of guilt constitutes formidable evidence against the accused on the principle that no one will knowingly, freely, and deliberately admit author's authorship of a crime unless prompted by truth and conscience, particularly where the facts given could only have been known by the accused, People versus Fabro, GR 95089. It is immaterial where the confession was obtained, thus where the confession was given by the accused to NBI agents who visited him in a Hong Kong prison, the confession was still declared inadmissible in evidence, People versus Gomez. On the other hand, any allegations of force, duress, and due influence or other forms of involuntariness in exacting such confession must be proved by clear, convincing, and competent evidence by the defense. Otherwise, the confession's full probative value may be used to demonstrate the guilt of the accused. People v. Iglipa Fruits of Poisonous Tree In People v. Alicandro the court declared that we have also adopted the libertarian exclusionary rule known as the fruit of the poisonous tree, a phrase minted by Mr. Justice Felix Frankfurter in the celebrated Nardone versus U.S. According to this rule, 
Once the primary source, the tree, is shown to have been unlawfully obtained and is secondary or derivative evidence, the fruit derived from it is also inadmissible. The rule is based on the principle that evidence illegally obtained by the state should not be used to gain other evidence because the original illegally obtained evidence taints all evidence subsequently obtained. Thus, in this case, the uncounseled admission being inadmissible, the pillow and the t-shirt with alleged blood stains being evidence derived from the uncounseled confession would likewise be inadmissible. Receipt of seized property inadmissible. The receipt of seized property signed by the accused without the assistance of counsel and with the accused not being been first informed of his constitutional rights is totally inadmissible in evidence. Thus, in People v. Wong, Chuan Ming, where the accused were ordered to sign their baggage boxes by customer customs agent, the admissions and signatures were held to be inadmissible in evidence. In People v. Tornina Zalazar, GR No. 98060, January 27, 1997, where the suspect was made to sign a bond paper which was used to wrap the marijuana sticks before the same were submitted to the laboratory for examination. The Supreme Court held that this was in the nature of an uncounseled confession and therefore inadmissible in evidence. People versus Delara. It was held that despite the valid warrantless arrest and search and as a result of a Bible's operation, nonetheless, where the accused insisting that he would like to wait for counsel was made to sign the photocopy of the marked 20 peso bill received of property seized and the booking and information sheet without the assistance of counsel, there was clearly a violation of the Section 12, Article 3 of the Constitution. Similarly, in Marcelo versus Sandig and Bayan, where during the investigation conducted by the NBI, the petitioner and his co-accused were made to sign on the envelope seized from them, subject of the mail theft. The Supreme Court said that these signatures were actually evidence of admission contemplated in Sections 12 and 17, and they should be excluded. However, in People v. Lin Sangan, although the accused was not assisted by counsel when he initialed the 10 peso bills that the police found tucked in his waist, it was held that neither his right against self-incrimination nor his rights guaranteed by the Miranda Doctrine was violated because his possession of the marked bills did not constitute a crime. The subject of the prosecution being his act of selling marijuana cigarettes. Likewise, in People v. Morico, it was held that the signing of the booking sheet and the arrest report without the benefit of counsel does not violate the Constitution because it is not an admission of guilt. Thus, when Section 12, Article 3 is not complied with during custodial investigation, only evidence of the confession or admission of the accused are covered by the exclusionary rule. Kowai Pang versus People. Reenactment of the crime. Not being clear from the record that before the reenactment was staged by the accused, he had been informed of his constitutional rights and that he had validly waived such rights before proceeding with the demonstration, the Supreme Court declined to uphold the admissibility of evidence relating to the reenactment. People versus Luvendino. Res or rages tie, the declaration of the accused acknowledging guilt made to the police desk officer after the crime was committed may be given in evidence against him by the police officer to whom the admission was made as part of the rest just tie. People versus D. Waiver of the exclusionary rule. For failure of the accused to object to the offer in evidence, the uncounseled Confession was admitted in evidence. People v. Samus, GR 135957. Right to bail, Section 13, Article 3. All persons except those charged with offenses punishable by reclusion perpetua, when evidence of guilt is strong, shall before conviction be bailable by sufficient surities or be released on recognizance as may be provided by law. The right to bail shall not be impaired even when the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus is suspended. Excessive bail shall not be required as well. 
Bail is the security given for the release of a person in custody of the law furnished by him or a bondsman, conditioned upon his appearance before any court as may be required. Rule 114, Section 1, Rules of Court. The right to bail emanates from the right to be presumed innocent. When right may be invoked, by whom? The right to bail emanates from the right to be presumed innocent. It is accorded to the person in custody of the law who may be, by reason of the presumption of innocence he enjoys, be allowed provisional liberty upon filing a security to guarantee his appearance before any court as required under specific circumstances. People v. Fitzgerald, GR 149723. And a person under detention, even if no formal charges have yet been filed, can invoke the right to bail. The Hunky v. Rivera, People v. San Diego. However, it is a basic principle that the right to bail can be availed of only by a person who is in custody of the law or otherwise deprived of his liberty. It would be premature not to say incongruous to file petition for bail for someone whose freedom has not yet to be curtailed. Curtis v. Judge Catral. Rule 114, which provides, among others, that any person in custody who is not yet charged in court may apply for bail with only any court in the province, city, or municipality where he is held. In Enrile v. Salazar, where the petitioners were charged with rebellion, complex with murder and multiple frustrated murder, the court ruled that based on the doctrine enunciated in People v. Hernandez, the question information filed against the petitioners must be read as charging simple rebellion only. Hence, the petitioners are entitled to bail before final conviction as a matter of right. In People v. Judge Donato, it was held that the right to bail cannot be denied one who is charged with rebellion, a bailable offense. In Algol versus Court of Appeals, since the penalty for illegal possession of firearms had been reduced to less than reclusion perpetua, the petitioners were deemed entitled to bail as a matter of right before their conviction by the trial court. In Lavides v. Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court held that the trial court was in error when the latter required the arraignment of the accused as a prerequisite to the approval of the bail. Arraign, arraignment, the bail, no, I'm sorry, the bail bond. In the cases when bail is authorized, it should be granted before arraignment, otherwise the accused may be precluded from filing a motion to quash. Furthermore, the court would be assured of the presence of the accused at the arraignment precisely by granting bail and ordering his presence at any stage of the proceeding. Exceptions when charged with an offense punishable by reclusion perpetua or higher, and evidence of guilt is strong. In Carpio v. Judge Magalalang, the Supreme Court said that where the accused is charged with an offense punishable by reclusion perpetua, it is the duty of the judge to determine if evidence of guilt is strong for purposes of deciding whether bail may be granted or not. In People v. Fortes and Fortes v. Judge Guan, it was held that if an accused who is charged with a crime punishable by reclusion perpetua is convicted by the trial court and sentenced to suffer such a penalty, bail is neither a matter of right on the part of the accused nor a matter of discretion on the part of the court. An application for bail must be denied. In People v. Reyes, the Supreme Court held that where a person has been convicted by the trial court and sentenced to the penalty of imprisonment for 22 years, the penalty imposed is classified as reclusion perpetua, and while the case is on appeal, bail may be denied because the offense is punishable by reclusion perpetua and the evidence of guilt is strong. Traditionally, the right to bail is not available to the military. In Comendador v. Davila, it was held that traditionally, the right to bail has not been recognized and is not available to the military as an exception to the Bail of Rights. This must be, or this was suggested in Arulo v. Espino, where the court observed that the right to speed trial is given more emphasis in the military where the right to bail does not exist. The denial of the right to bail to the military does not violate the Equal Protection Clause because there is substantial distinction between the military and the civilians. Duty of the court, when accused is charged with an offense punishable by reclusion perpetual or higher, 
a hearing on the motion for bail must be conducted by the judge to determine whether or not the evidence of guilt is strong, whether the motion is resolved in summary proceedings or in course of regular trial, the prosecution must be given an opportunity to present all the evidence that it may wish to introduce on the probable guilt of the accused before the court resolves the motion for bail. Even if the prosecution refuses to adduce evidence or fails to interpose an objection to the motion for bail, it is still mandatory for the court to conduct a hearing or ask searching and clarificatory questions from which it may infer the strength of the evidence of guilt or lack of it against the accused. Bailon versus Judge Dison and Marolag versus Judge Floribel. In Tukai versus Judge Dumagas, the court found that judge to have violated the rules of court because all that the provincial prosecutor interposed no objection to the petition of bail filed by the accused, it was still incumbent upon the judge to set the petition for hearing and diligently ascertain from the prosecution whether the latter was not really contesting the bail publication. In the Los Santos Reyes versus Judge Montesa, the court sanctioned the judge who, after examining the records of the case, cases forwarded to him by the prosecution and after finding the existence of probable cause instead of issuing the corresponding warrant of arrest for the purpose of acquiring jurisdiction over the persons of the accused ex mero moto granted a bail to the accused despite the absence because of prior withdrawal of a petition for bail and worse the lack of hearing wherein the prosecution could have been accorded the right to present evidence showing that the evidence of guilt was strong. In Busan versus Judge Velasco, the court reiterated the rule that bail is not a matter of right in cases where the offense for which the accused stands charged is punishable by reclusion perpetua, where the evidence of guilt is strong. While it is true that the weight of the evidence adduced is addressed to the sound discretion of the court, such discretion may be exercised only after the hearing called to ascertain the degree of guilt of the accused. At the hearing, the court should assure that the prosecution is afforded the opportunity to adduce evidence relevant to the factual issue, with the applicant having the right of cross-examination and to introduce his own evidence in rebuttal. Without a hearing, the judge could not possibly assess the weight of the evidence against the accused before granting the latter's application for bail. In Basco versus Judge Rapatalo, the Supreme Court reiterated that in application for bail of a person charged with capital offenses, punishable by reclusion, perpetua, death, or life imprisonment, a hearing, whether summary or otherwise in the discretion of the court, must actually be conducted to determine whether or not evidence of guilt against the accused is strong. See also People versus Manis. 122737 in Tubao versus Judge Espina. The hearing on a petition for bail did not at all times precede arraignment because the rule is that a person deprived of his liberty by virtue of his arrest or voluntary surrender may apply for bail as soon as he is deprived of his liberty, even before a complaint or information is filed against him. When bail is a matter of right, the accused may apply for and be granted bail even prior to arraignment. Even when the charge is a capital offense, if the court finds that the accused is entitled to bail because the evidence of guilt is not strong, he may be granted provisional liberty even before arraignment. Serapio v. Sandy Combayan. In Lavides v. Court of Appeal, the accused filed a petition for bail as well as a motion to quash, and the court said that in cases where it is authorized bail, it is authorized bail should be granted before arraignment, otherwise the accused may be precluded from filing a motion to quash. Let's repeat that. In Lavides versus Court of Appeals, the accused filed a petition for bail as well as a motion to quash. And the court said that in cases where it is authorized, bail should be granted before arraignment. Otherwise, the accused may be precluded from filing a motion to quash. The court's order granting or refusing bail must contain a summary of the evidence for the prosecution people versus Judge Cabral. The assessment of the evidence presented during bail hearing is intended only for the purpose of granting or denying an application for bail or for the provisional release of the accused not being a final assessment. Courts tend to be liberal in their appreciation of evidence, but it is not an uncommon occurrence that an accused person granted bail is convicted in due course. 
People versus Palarca. Bail is either a matter of right at the judge's discretion or it may be denied. Rule 114. Bail as a matter of right. All persons in custody shall be for or after conviction by the Metropolitan Court, Municipal Trial Court, Municipal Trial Court in cities and Municipal Trial Circuit Trial Courts in before conviction by the RTC of an offense not punishable by death, reclusion perpetua, or life imprisonment may be admitted to bail or be admitted to bail as a matter of right with sufficient sureties or be released and recognizance as prescribed by law or this rule. When a discretionary, upon conviction by the RTC of an offense not punishable by death, reclusion perpetua, or life imprisonment, the court on application may admit the accused to bail. The court in its discretion may allow the accused to continue on provisional liberty under the same bail bond during the period to appeal subject to the consent of the bondsman. If the court imposes a penalty of imprisonment exceeding six years, but not more than 20 years, the accused shall be denied bail. Six years, but not more than 20 years, the bail must be denied. Or his bail previously granted shall be cancelled upon a showing by the prosecution with notice to the accused of the following or other similar circumstances. Number one, committed the crime aggravated by the circumstances of reiteration that the accused is found to have previously escaped from legal confinement, evaded sentence or has violated the condition of his bail without valid justification. Three, that the accused committed the offense while on probation, parole, or under conditional pardon. That the circumstances of the accused or his case indicate the probability of flight if released on bail. That there is undue risk that during the pendency of the appeal, the accused may commit another crime. However, whether bail is a matter of right or discretion, reasonable notice of hearing is required to be given to the prosecutor to the prosecutor or at the least at least he must be asked for his recommendation because in fixing the amount of bail the judge is required to take into account a number of factors such as the applicant's character and reputation for feature of other bonds